Meet David Christian, a big historian. He's a his specialist in Russian history. He's at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. And he has given a TED Talk, a very influential one, on the history of our world in 18 minutes. It's pretty good for 18 minutes. It's a TED Talk 2011. Now, he has also gotten a lot of attention because he has collaborated with Bill Gates with some money, and they've produced some uh, online courses for high school students about big history, the history of everything. Now, David Christian has also written several books. Here are two of them, Maps of Time about big history and The Origin Story, a big history of everything. I sat down with David at his house outside of Sydney, Australia, and we talked all things big history, whether the universe is getting more complicated with time, and are we alone? My name is David Christian, and I teach big history at Macquarie University. Aha! And I'm originally a Russian historian. A Russian historian. Okay. And uh, oh, I have a book of yours that's right in front of you there. Now, can you sign it for us? Absolutely. I'd All right. To. I don't actually don't have a pen. I've got a pen. You've got a pen. Please sign it for us there. So you do big history. Yes. And, uh, and part of that is there are several thresholds that you talk about in your big history. Could you tell us a little bit about these thresholds? Yeah. Big history began really as, with me feeling as a historian that I that 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 historians need to know what the whole of history is they need to ask the question at some point what's the whole of history and when I began asking myself that question I realized pretty quickly that it only made sense if you went right back to the Big Bang uh, and I'd always read read good popular science so the original idea was to teach a history of the universe and see how history in the more conventional sense fits into that but over the years um, when I first began teaching it it was hard to find a sort of clear storyline and, and a clear structure. But I think over the years, the idea of increasing complexity emerged as a, as a good, manageable, also, I think, scientifically interesting storyline. I'm acutely aware there's lots of other nuances that are missed by this idea of Goldilocks conditions, increasing energy flows and, and complexity. But the story of increasing complexity Given that my audience consists of human beings, not cockroaches and not, you know, not protons, um, it's really interesting for us because you can argue that the, the, the world we live in today is damn close to the most complex thing that we know about. I think there may be a general rule that the more complex things are built with greater difficulty, that the, the Goldilocks conditions are much more stringent, so in, and they don't live as long. So in some sense, they're more fragile. And if we want to make sense of the Anthropocene, of today's world, if we want to not mess it up, we really have to understand this tension between entropy and complexity. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you mentioned the word Goldilocks. That's not a, a term that astronomers would be comfortable no, with. No, no, but I you use that, so can you talk to that issue? So the idea of Goldilocks conditions is one that I use most of the time, you know, within the universe, that there are spaces in the universe where, for reasons we may not fully understand, you get just the right conditions for increasing complexity. You choose questions that are interesting, and they are interesting for me as a historian. In fact, I would, I would argue that scientists by and large have been much more open than people in the human, scholars in the humanities to the idea of telling a sort of universal, a modern universal story. The problem is when they tell it, and I think this was true even of, of, of Carl, Carl Sagan, for example, is that they, as you say, they, they lose interest once they get to humans. But for a lot of humans, it really is interesting to know, you know, how the Industrial Revolution happened, how in the last 200 years uh, we've developed a world, which you, you, you move from sort of 900 million to 7 billion. Um, the last 5 billion appeared in my own life. How the hell does that happen? And what are the dangers around it? So all of those questions are very specific questions. And you can only, only ask them if you actually focus on the details of the trajectory of change over human history. And there's another question. You, you, you talked about whether this was a sort of species arrogance. And I, I, I'm fascinated, <laughs> well, yeah, fascinated by that question. And, 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 and I think, um, of course, it may be. I mean, my list of thresholds, the last three, involve humans. And if you look at the timeline, that's ridiculous because mm -hmm. we just end up buried in the, in the last line of the timeline. But I, th 
I, I often wonder whether it's just a species arrogance or whether it's just that I'm talking to humans. So I say, look, we're interested in humans, so let's just yeah, forget about the title. We've, we've evolved to be interested it's, in ourselves. What's exactly. wrong with that? <laughs> so that, that's a possible answer. Yeah. But I'd love to think there may be a slightly deeper answer. And that, I think, is that the appearance of our species on this planet really does objectively count as a threshold moment. And I'm thinking of the Anthropocene. The first species in four billion years, and I think it's linguistic, that has the capacity to exchange ideas, as we're doing, with such precision, in such bandwidth, that ideas accumulate across generations. We know that does not happen for any other species. We know that because if it did, we'd see evidence of it. So this MOOC is about how did we get here, and the hope is that by looking at how we got here, we could figure out whether we're alone or not. Yeah. In other words, if you try to assign probabilities to the events that led to us. Now, what's the probability of Russian? If we have live in an infinite universe, how many other Earth-like planets did we have to, would we have to get in order to have a Russia? I would think it's, it's got to be close to infinite, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know. I, this is a hard no. game we're trying to play here. But, but my understanding is that, that over the last 30 or 40 years, I mean, I, as I've been interested in, in trying to make sense of this, so I read good popular science. And when I began doing this, astrobiology was a joke, scientifically. It was what science, science fiction writers did. And I've watched it become a science. And I think one of the things is that now that Drake equation, we can actually fill in quite a few more of, more of the blanks on the Drake equation, above all exoplanets. Now, I've seen an estimate, I don't know how respectable it is, that even in our Milky Way, there may be 17 billion vaguely Earth-like planets. Um, well, how many would you need to have in order to have a human being or a uh, intelligent species or life or Russia? I, these are things... <laughs> uh, can you make any Russia estimate? Russia is extraordinarily specific. But back how about to Putin is even more specific. Even right? more specific, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you'd, you'd won a lot of universes before you had two Putins, I think.